In just a couple of hours, the jury will begin deliberations in the high-stakes uh, Kyle Rittenhouse trial. The 18-year-old is accused of killing two people and injuring a third during police brutality protests in Wisconsin last year. Jurors will consider five charges against Rittenhouse, including first-degree intentional homicide, which could send him to prison for life. So joining us now is CBS News legal contributor and former Manhattan prosecutor, Rebecca Royfe. So, Rebecca, the case is now in the hands of the jury. They have to consider five different charges. Is there any way to sort of ballpark, you know, how long it will take them to come to a conclusion and when we can expect a verdict? There isn't really. I mean, you, you can you can guess based on the complexity of the facts, but you know these things are really subjective, and it depends on how united the jury is to start with. And so, it you know is really hard to suggest. I mean, I, you know, I would think a week would be reasonable, but if the jury ends up having you know a lot of arguments and having difficulty coming to consensus on some of the facts, then you could see it drag on for longer than that. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and when you consider how long it took just for the judge to deliver the instructions, um, then, you know, you know that they, they've got a lot to think about, especially, I mean, there were several arguments throughout that process over how words should be interpreted and phrases should be interpreted. So Judge Bruce Schroeder, uh, he is allowing the jury to consider lesser charges in the case. This is one area where there's a bit of back and forth. Um, can you explain what that means and how it would work for the jury? Yeah, so the um, lesser included offenses um, are offenses that are related to the same facts but require fewer elements, so require the prosecutor to have proved fewer elements. And that can be um, good for the prosecution in a case like this, especially in a politically charged case, because if the jury, um, let's say, is divided over some of the harsher charges but wants to reach a conviction, this could be a compromise. So if you have some jurors who want to acquit and other jurors who want, you know, at the outset want to, you know, believe that he should be convicted, sometimes these lesser included offenses are a way to get to consensus. And so, you know, very frequently they are actually a good thing for the prosecution, especially if the prosecution is somewhat concerned about some of the more serious charges and about whether the evidence really has um, been substantial and able to support those charges. So one of the charges that the jury won't consider is a misdemeanor weapons charge after the judge dropped it yesterday. And there was a lot of back and forth over the phrasing of this, whether or not it should be dropped. Is that dismissal significant? Sure. You know, so first of all, it, it, it was a significant thing, because just like I was saying about the lesser included offenses, this least serious charge was a way, would have provided a way for the jury to reach a conviction on at least one count. And given that the fact, given the fact that there are so many people out there who are looking for, you know, some kind of consequence for this, because they feel like, you know, this, this, there, you know, there were underlying injustices that were going on, and that Rittenhouse hasn't been treated, you know, the same way as other people have been treated. There are those people out there, and this would have at least provided a conviction because it looked like an easy case. But the thing is, when you look at the actual law, it just wasn't as easy as it seemed because the law actually had to do with essentially what we would say um, in you know, it is like a sawed off shotgun. So, so Wisconsin is an open carry state. It's very permissive about weapons. And what this law was actually trying to do was prevent minors from carrying, um, sawed off shotguns. And so because this gun that he had, the AR-15, did not have a short barrel, it really did not fit into the language of the statute. So, you know, there are these sort of rude awakenings in these trials where you realize that, you know, something seems so wrong, and yet under the laws, it may not be criminal. And, you know, I think that that in some ways is the... Um, moral of this story. I mean, we'll see what happens with the jury, but that, you know, you can look at a situation and say something went totally wrong and it may not end up in a conviction. And that can be very, very frustrating for people who are seeking justice.
Yeah, I think you sort of summed up this case, actually, the challenges when it comes to this case. Um, one thing that was surprising was that the defendant took the stand in, is in his own defense. And we always hear, oh, it's very rare that in, you know, homicide cases that defendants take the stand. But this is a case where we're talking about a self-defense defense. How impa impactful is a, def is a defendant testimony when the jury is considering a self-defense case? Right. So as you said, normally it's quite unusual for a defendant to take the stand. It's so risky and most defense attorneys would advise their clients not to do it. But when you raise a self-defense claim, the calculus is a little bit different because it so depends on the reasonableness of the individual's sense of fear under these circumstances that without calling the individual, it makes it much more difficult. It's not impossible, but makes it much more difficult for the defense to establish that self-defense claim. And so it is less unusual and it's still risky. So the question is here, what happened? Did Rittenhouse help uh, his lawyers um, establish self-defense or not? And, you know, I, I, it, it, it really depends on how he came across. And I think different people received, you know, reacted differently to his testimony. And we'll see how the jury did. Yeah, exactly. Rebecca Royfee, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Amory.